Thank you, thank you. Um, I'll just set my li little timer. So, um, where am I? Uh, I'm a learning designer, e-learning designer, instructional designer, kind of goes by different names depending on what organisation you might work, um, work for. And um, I've more recently um, taken on work at the uh, film school. Um, so, I'll give you a little bit of background as to that film school. If you were here yesterday and saw my presentation, this is an identical slide. Um, so, the AFT AFTRS is um, founded in the mid-70s, um, and they've used Moodle since 2013. They have different types of courses. Award courses are uh, bachelor and master's courses, and they go for several years. However, I'm in the short courses area, which is anything from a one-day course to a 12-week course or a five-day course. Um, there's a very heavy emphasis on industry professionals teaching the courses and a heavy emphasis on face-to-face -face as well. So that all has to be incorporated into the learning design. Now, this concept of subject matter experts. So some people don't use that term, subject matter expert or SME. Um, and so, basically, I have worked for lots of different organisations over the years, from the early 90s. And so, some of my SMEs have been hairdressers or bricklayers, surgeons, um, doctors, academics at universities. And so, currently, my SMEs are filmmakers. So, it might be someone that is a production manager of a reality TV show, for example or a, um, a producer, a film producer, or an accountant um, on a um, film project. So I don't know much about the intricacies of um, producing a film, and so that's where me as the learning designer sitting off to the side there, and the SME inevitably has their big pile of content. So they know things. I know things. So. Um, Basically, I like to put the SME right in the middle and so and work around them with all the different emotions and tasks that go with that. And then the learning designer, which is me, I know how to organise content and design learning experiences. I'm sure most people in this room um, can, that might resonate with. So, um, generally we have a project and within that project there is parameters like time, uh, what LMS you are using, so currently we're using Moodle, um, a schedule, again this big pile of content, you generally have a, a, a user guide or a course outline rather, unit guide, that type of thing, and then generally there's other people involved, but generally the, at the core of the team is the SME and the learning designer. And yesterday on Twitter I saw Colin had mentioned something about the, the benefits of co-designing. So you could conceive that the tasks completed by the learning designer and an SME, they're working as co-designers essentially. So number one, th there's ten top tips. So number one, I find that um, before starting anything I like to just establish trust. And so I just meet for a coffee. Uh, that's just to establish a mutual rep respect, uh, confidence in, in each other. Um, confident that you'll guide them on, with online learning. Often the, an SME doesn't have a lot of experience with online learning. Some of them don't have any experience with learning at all. No teaching background, um, depending on the circumstances. And so it's always important just to lay out um, some, some kind of guiding principles in that area. Um, I like to ask them, well, have you taught before? Or, you know, um, do you have any teaching experience? Um, there's other things like working, working styles and personalities, um, different approaches to project tasks. Um, and so the whole point of this first tip is to establish who you are, how you're going to work together, um, at what strengths do you have. So number two, I like to look at schedules and budgets. I'd so they're not inherently interesting, but it provides a, almost like a mechanical framework to work within. So if you, don't, if you only have one month to complete the work, you're going to approach it in a slightly different way to if you have one year. 
And so if you've got $100,000 versus $10,000, how are you going to spend that money? Sometimes these decisions are not made by the learning designer or the SME, they're made by the project manager. Or, you know, it's, it gets complicated, as you can um, probably predict. Um, a lot of these are re about restrictions, but within restrictions, it's like with any good design process, if you're given a restriction or a parameter, sometimes that helps the design process flourish um, as people look for opportunities. Um, I think I've covered all of those except for the last one, or the last couple maybe. Milestones and deliverables, what are they? What are we doing? How do we know we've achieved the end of the project or this milestone? Make, make these sort of things tangible, because if you have things that are tangible, then I just find that it just sets a really nice, sensible tone. Um, here's that woman again. So most of the women will know who this woman is. I don't know if a lot of the men would know who this woman is. However, she likes to tidy up. And so she has this phrase, does it spark joy? So she generally helps people to declutter. So what I find, and this is, again, I've kind of been engaging with SMEs since the, the mid-90s, and so um, they generally have a big load of um, content, and that content is often confused with, oh, that's all there is to the teaching process, because content is king. You've probably heard that phrase before. So I like to encourage the subject matter expert to get rid of some of the content that maybe it's out of date, maybe it's not working, maybe it's not appropriate, maybe it's not in a form we can use. So just either bin it or let's put it in our in tray for the project. Um, sometimes that's kind of, I have a flippant tone as I'm talking, but it's kind of, um, I guess, yeah, it's a, it's a good, decent conversation to bring up. And sometimes it can be confronting. Um, because, you know, I'm a lowly learning designer. I don't know anything about um, beef cattle or cutting hair or operating on a person in a hospital. So I guess it's kind of just establishing that, that kind of um, trust, as, as mentioned earlier, but all, all uh, to frame the idea of an audit, audit of content. Um, collecting and collating. Sometimes the things that wash up on shore are te text, images, videos, PDFs, start getting them into folders, that sort of thing. Ho horribly sensible. Um, okay, I like this image. I've used this image since... I, when I was preparing these slides um, oh, a couple of months ago, I've used this in a couple of meetings where I've, I've heard the tone of voice or it's a little vibe and I've thought, oh, I'm not going to have any words, I'll just point and I say, that's you and that's me. And they sort of like a bit shocked and confused because often I find that there's a, um, that it's like a tug of war over who owns the content. And so sometimes a learning designer, it's not their job to know stuff necessarily. And so, um, although we are our own subject matter experts in terms of learning and, you know, how to collate things, um, offering de design solutions. So I just like to um, ask the question of who owns this content? Sometimes it's not the subject matter expert, sometimes it's their manager, or sometimes it's some someone else. It's kind of like, uh, it's, it, and this can have um, IP, intellectual property um, ramifications. Um, well, should this content stay or go? Sometimes it needs to be checked or confirmed, amended, replaced. Um, and then that taps, of course, into tasks and workflow, schedules. Um, sometimes you have to be working with content you didn't create, so that, that um, introduces a whole bunch of uh, issues. Uh, uh, and then it's good to remind the SME that our aim as a, as a project team is to create engaging and meaningful learning experiences. So the content is an important part of that. So is learning design. So I like to draw an analogy. I, um, uh, Jocelyn this morning was, was bringing in a whole heap of metaphors. So I've used this metaphor quite a lot where it's a dinner party and there's an introduction and a topic one and a topic two, also known as a main dish, a side dish, dessert, that type of thing. 
So they're all optional. Sometimes they're interchangeable. Sometimes they're not negotiable. Sometimes they're related to um, an external body that might be kind of assessing the learner. There's all these different dynamics. Um, there's also this concept of hierarchy as well. So I like to just talk through the Moodle interface together and say, look, if we put your content here, this is what it would look like. There was a, a question from yesterday about these um, troublesome high school teachers. I used to be a high school teacher. So I can relate to some of the issues that were brought up about, well, if we've got a section in Moodle, we want a subsection and we want a sub-subsection and we want that to be final, final text. And it's like, well, some of these problems are solved in a non-technical way, if I can say it that way. Um, and then I guess it's kind of reminding the SME that there's this thing called learning design and uh, linking how their content might be structured in a way. So that can be really delightfully fun and, and productive at the same time because you, you're negotiating, you're co-designing essentially. Um, now I like this one, negotiating new content. Because sometimes you're going along really well and everyone's confident and comfortable. And um, all of a sudden there's gaps in the content as symbolised by letter C and letter F. And that sometimes the subject matter expert starts to lose it because they're linked somehow to their content. And if there's gaps in the content, then that diminishes their value or something. I don't know. It's very mysterious. But that's me on the right. And I have used um, Latin text in the background for those with a sharp eye. So that's a form of dummy text. It's like, let's just keep calm and put a placeholder in and get on with the whole picture. And I, the, I was uh, liaising with someone the other day and I pointed to the, the picture of the guy with the, the um, what is, question mark over his head. But she wasn't in that place, and so it's kind of, you know, I'm, I'm overgeneralising because um, it's kind of, everyone's a person, but, um, and they've got individual ways of dealing with things. Um, but yeah, I guess it's this concept of gaps in content and how do you deal with that, and who's going to develop it, maybe how much is that going to cost, that type of thing. Uh, I like to negotiate communication and workflow. Now, the person in this image is, is in... Uh, watching an interpretive dancer and with a checklist and we've got two minutes okay <laughs> so um, how do you swap files is it death by 50 emails with a uh, five gig or five meg attachments or do you use a cloud-based system that comes up all the time for me so I like to just establish some of these protocols um, here's this proof of concept I brought this up yesterday if you are um, witnessing the, um, the presentation from yesterday, I like to just build a little quick proof of concept so that um, we get to visualise what does that look like in Moodle and that, that consolidates a lot of the thinking, I find. Um, and then, of course, once you've achieved a stable prototype, then you can start to proceed. Um, it's always nice to just have that stability and feedback, etc. Um, upskill, as in professional development. Undoubtedly, there will be a need for some something within the process. So it might be how do you use a particular tool within Moodle. Um, you don't waste your time with doing grand um, professional development um, kind of programs. Just a just-in-time approach, I find, re works really well. Need-to-know basis. Um, it might be just as simple as a short walkthrough. Um, and then finally, this is a concept I like to introduce. It's, it's a reminder that it's not just, oh, here's this big bucket of content, give it to the learning designer, they go away and, and do their magic. It really is a team of learning designer, IT support, back-end infrastructure people, um, maybe a, a specialist media producer, um, other other kind of um, support people within an ecosystem, essentially. So that's my presentation. So we've got time for a few questions.
Yes? Do you mean learning outcomes? No, as in like, um, as part of like delivery outcomes, I guess. Yeah, we could say learning outcomes. So like, if the output was to build a lesson, yep. it doesn't achieve the learning outcome. Yep. Have you actually achieved what you're trying to do? That's a really big question. And I guess it's linked to documentation. So if you have, um, as one of your very early deliverables, uh, some sort of documentation that is kind of like reassuring everyone in the project team, including various layers of management, well, what are you going to produce in this period of time? How does that sit in within the context? Um, you can inbuild, uh, build in critical assessment or a QA type of cycle, that type of thing. So um, is this kind of addressing where you, what you were asking? Yeah, there's ways, there's, there's good old fashioned project management mechanisms to build in to any design and development um, and delivery process. So, and they're, they're really sensible and really good to put in because they, are, they, they're, they allow everyone to manage the risk and reduce the ambiguity um, so that everyone's clear, okay? And then with the vocational education, um, there's the AQTF framework, for example, so that's kind of like a nice check. Well, is this resource going to map to those competencies, for example? So you might have a little team that are doing that while you're developing something, another module or something like that. Excellent. If you could please join me in uh, thanking Mark for his presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.